amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, so many things to be thankful for, Lord. But this morning, we're so thankful for your word, Lord. And this time together in your word, Lord. So as we dig in, continue in this book of Revelation, Lord. Reveal to us. Help us to see, Lord, with eyes wide open what it is that you have for us that's also important for the coming days, Lord. So bless this time together, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And good morning and welcome. You can be seated. Those of you online joining us, we want to welcome you as well. We're continuing in our study through the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And Today's text will be chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. I know you just sat down, but if you're able, I'll ask you to stand again. Are you like having Catholic church flashbacks here? And I'm sorry, that was kind of mean. The Apostle John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, now is going to continue what he's seeing in his description in this vision of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So now verse 15, he goes on to say, his feet, speaking of Jesus, were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Think waterfalls. In his right hand, verse 16, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. I would have too. (laughs) Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Chicken skin already. I just read it. Wow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher and our guide, who gives us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive that which you have for us here in your word today. Lord, I I pray that it would be an encouraging word for those who need encouragement. It would bring hope to those who find themselves losing hope, and strength to those who are just so down and so weak, so defeated. And power, Lord, just the power of the Holy Spirit in and through your Holy Word to us as your people. Lord, would you minister to us, speak to us? We know your voice. We know it's you. And comfort, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I won't make you stand up again for a while, so you get a little bit of time. In the previous verses, verses 12 through 14, we looked at who Jesus is to us. And today in verses 15 through 18, we're going to look at what Jesus does for us. And here's why. John, again, in his continuation of his description of his revelation of Jesus, is describing that which he receives as a vision from Jesus. 
Can you just put yourself there? I mean, you know, what's lost sometimes when we're reading the Word of God is that we're all prone to it. I'm just as prone as anyone. They're just words on a page until the Holy Spirit breathes life on them, and they come to life as the Word of life. And sometimes in order for God's Word to come to life, because God's Word is alive, and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, as we're going to see here shortly in Hebrews. Because this is the same wording, different word in the original, that John is using to describe what comes out of the mouth of Jesus in this vision of Jesus, a sharp double-edged sword. So it's just words on a page. We're all prone to read past and fast through them. But I think we would err greatly to do that. And if we do that, we do so to our own peril, because what, what's going to happen is we're going to miss what it is that God has for us in just this portion that we have before us here today in God's Word. Every word is in God's Word for a reason. All scriptures inspired by God, God breathed. And sometimes it's for our direction, redirection, correction, rebuke. We don't like that one. But it's also for our edification and instruction to guide us, as Psalm 119, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, Thy word, O Lord, is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. It, it lights the way. It shows me the way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. This is good between me and the Holy Spirit, my spirit bearing witness with the Holy Spirit. See, I could have taught this portion of chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, very differently. <laughs> Some of you maybe wish I would. But I chose not to after spending some time with the Lord, because I wanted to build that bridge between what John is describing and what does that mean for me? Because as one said so aptly, knowledge is just information, but wisdom is the application of that information. See, I can get up here and I guess I could probably uh, you know, uh, stand with the rest in my pontification and explanation and dissertation of the scriptures that we have before us today. But then what's going to happen is you're going to, was that too much? <laughs> that was maybe too much for me. Okay, let's bring it back. The problem with that is you're going to walk away and go, wow, that was very informative. But it didn't touch you. It didn't reach you. It didn't minister to you. I mean, that's a great explanation. Oh, your exposition, Pastor, of the text, superb. Well, whatever word you want to use, I'll use superb. But now I'm going to go home and face life. And what does verses 15 through 18 in Revelation chapter 1, and how is it that going to apply to what I'm going to go home to? A prodigal son, a wayward daughter, a sick loved one or even worse, the recent death of a loved one. I mean, so, okay, so Jesus has feet, bronze glowing like in a furnace, and a mouth with a sharp double-edged sword. And I mean, okay, yay. I, ho I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. I'm not trying in any way to come off as crass or rude. I'm just trying to communicate a very 
powerful and profound truth here. And that is we have Scripture here that Jesus had John write for us here today, that applies to us here today, to your life, to my life, something we can take home with us and begin that process by the power of the Holy Spirit to apply to our lives, to that trial we're going through, to that situation we're in, to that impossible set of circumstances that we find ourselves in. Well now, I've got something because God's Word's alive and it comes alive in my life. I've got something I can get my hands on, my mind around, and I can use it. That's what I want to try to do. That's my introduction. Was that okay? Well, Pastor, you probably could have said the same thing without taking so much time to say it. It's a gift. (laughs) Each and every detail has profound implications for us as it relates to both who Jesus is to us, we talked about that last week, and what Jesus does for us. That's this week. You ready? Let's jump in. The first one in verse 15, Jesus empowers me. So here's John now continuing with the description of his vision and revelation of Jesus, which we, as we talked about last week, just spoiler alert, he's not coming as a babe born in Bethlehem and the suffering servant and Savior. He's coming back as the conquering king. And this is so germane to our understanding because And by the way, this is probably as good of a time as any to, well, get this off my chest. Because as you know, I have to get things off my chest. You know these pictures we have of Jesus? Come on. I mean, an American Jesus. This is the American version. That's why you'll never see any graphic or image on that screen of a depiction of Jesus. I think, (laughs) first of all, if you actually knew what Jesus looked like, which by the way, by God's design, we don't know what Jesus looked like. Now, of course, that's not going to stop people from trying to depict what Jesus could have looked like. But what we know from Scripture is that there was nothing about Him that stood out. When He was arrested after Judas betrayed Him in the garden that night on His way to the cross, He just looked like everybody else. So Judas had to point him out to the guys he had just betrayed the Savior to by kissing him. The guy that I, you just paid me for to hand over to you, he's the guy I'm going to kiss. Oh, it's him. He's, he, he, didn't, he wasn't taller, handsome, but he was probably pretty rugged because he was a carpenter. And I take issue with, and this again, I just let me have this one. I have to get it off my chest. These pictures of this wimpy looking Savior, you know, meek and mild. I'm thinking, well, I don't, I don't know who that is. That's not my Jesus. That's not the Jesus that I have described here in the Bible. My Jesus went into the temple, made a whip, turned over the the tables of the money changers. Oh, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall of that temple to see that. He's slapping that, just the sound of that whip on the ground. We'll get back to our Bible study here in just a moment. But slapping that whip on the ground, yeah, that's my Jesus. That's my Savior right there. Turns those tables over. You think a weakling's going to do that? These, don't think Costco folding tables here. <laughs> they were wood at best, stone at, at worst. And my Jesus took those tables and threw them over like they were toothpicks. That's my Jesus. You got him like a wimpy, you know, blue eyes. I'm sorry. But the truth of the matter is that 
because Jesus was a Jew. I know, shocking. From the Middle East. Well, I'm from the Middle East. So I, he probably looked, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to let me have that one. I'm sorry, you cannot un imagine that, right? This, I guess what I'm trying to say is he, he, he at, when he was here the first time as the suffering Savior, he, he was not, you know, thin and weak looking and, you know, scrawny and blue eyes. And I even have questions about the hair. Now there is an argument to be made that he did take the Nazarite vow, but you know, we see these pictures of Jesus with really long hair. And the issue is, is that in, the, in Judaism, it was a shame for a man to have long hair. And it was also a shame, by the way, this is 1 Corinthians 7, women, I'm so sorry, don't go back online and watch the teaching on 1 Corinthians 7. It was brutal, one of the hardest teachings, because Paul talks about the women not having their hair cut short, <laughs> because it needs to be long. It's a symbol of the covering of God's authority structure. So just as it would be a shame for a man to have long hair, so too would it be a shame for a woman to have short hair. It's almost like a defiance thing. I'm actually going somewhere with this, believe it or not. But the description that we have of Jesus is going to be so shocking to all of us, and we're even told as much. In fact, it's very interesting. I think it's in Isaiah. I can't remember chapter and verse. I can't remember a lot of things. But we have this, this uh, description by the prophet Isaiah, uh, where he describes how we're going to, when we see Satan, we're just going to be blown away. And not in a good way. We're going to look at him and go, that's who deceived the nations. That, that's the devil. Where's the red tights? No, for real, where's the horns and the pitchfork? No, he is beautiful. What a beautiful creation. I've never seen, we're going to almost wince at him, totally shocked by what he really looks like. Now let's flip that around. You know what Isaiah the prophet says by the Holy Spirit about our reaction when we see Jesus? We're going to behold Him as the Lamb that was slain, scars and all. And I guess I'm trying to prepare you so that when that trumpet sounds and we meet the Lord in the air, I don't want any of you guys going, wow, you look nothing like what my pastor described. I would rather that they say, wow, you must have went to Calvary County, oh, because you guys aren't shocked. Everybody else says, because they went to another church where the pa no, okay. So, <laughs> I'm taking that way too far, but I think you get the point. I just want to prepare you for what you're in store for, because you're going to look at Him, behold Him as the Lamb that was slain, and you're going to have to look away for the opposite reason that you look away from Satan. His beauty is just stunning. But the Savior, we're going to wince because we're going to behold Him as the Lamb that was slain. And I'm just trying to prepare you. He's going to look nothing like the pictures that you have of Him. Now John is helping us out by bringing together, and this is where I was going, just so you know. <laughs> John's going to help us now to sort of connect the appearance of what Jesus looks like, and the symbolic meaning behind what Jesus looks like. It's not just, John, write about what I'm going to look like, and just get it to them, let them know, so they know. No, I want them to know that this is what I look like, but I also want them to know why. 
why my feet are bronze glowing in a furnace? Why last week my eyes were like blazing fire? This week, feet bronze glowing in a furnace. And not only that, but this is even more, wow. (laughs) That's the best word I can come up with. His voice like the sound of rushing waters. I was a kid. I couldn't have been, uh, well, I can actually tell you how old I was, because it was during uh, the World's Fair in 1974, which was in Spokane, Washington. I was born in 62. How old am I, 12? Well, thanks a lot for the help. I'm not feeling the love here. I'm 12 years old. I'm 12. And they have uh, what they call Spokane Falls. And that's where the the World's Fair site was, and they were preparing it. And my parents took us to see the progress, because that's where Expo 74 was going to be, in little old Spokane, Washington. So we went by the falls. I'm 12 years old, being the man's man that I am at 12. And the, the waters were particularly loud and scary just the sound of the falls. And <laughs> Spokane Falls, like this. Niagara Falls, <laughs> like that. Can you imagine the sound, the deafening sound of that powerful water rushing as it falls? That was his voice. Wait a minute. I thought it was a still small voice. Well, not now it's not. Well, why is it now the sound of rushing waters, like the waterfalls, just that thunderous, powerful, scary sound of that water? Because Jesus wants us to know that He is the source of our power. He empowers me. He's the power source, like we talked about last week. All of this speaks to the power of Jesus, who, listen, is omnipotent. That's a big word. It makes it sound like I went to cemetery. I mean seminary. I didn't. (laughs) Been to a cemetery, not a seminary. I taught in a Bible college, but I never went to one. How's that one? God's got a sense of humor. Omnipotent means omni, all potent power, all powerful. Here's another one. This this one's even cooler sounding. God is omniscient. Wow. What does omniscient mean again? Omniscience, all knowing. The third one. God is omnipresent. Now that one's helpful, because God is all present. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. So by extension in His omnipotence, He enables me and empowers me in and through His power, especially for the powerless. Have you ever felt powerless and helpless? Oh, come on. How many times have you heard even said, God helps those who helps themselves? When I was a very young believer, I mean, I was a babe in Christ, hadn't even read the Bible all the way through for the first time yet. And my cousin, who I'm trying to share Jesus with, I had a, here was my theology as a new believer. Jesus is real. He's really real. Jesus is really, really real. And you need Jesus because Jesus is really, really real. That was the best I had as a new believer, because I hadn't, you know, (laughs) I was just immature. So I'm trying to, because I love my cousin, I'm trying to tell him, hey, Jesus is real. I know Jesus now. Jesus saved me. I'm born again. And I want you to be born again. I want you to know Jesus. And, and he just looks at me and goes, well, you know, God helps those who help themselves. He was thinking that he was quoting Scripture. It's not in the Bible. It might be First Thessalonians chapter 1, but it's not in this Bible. Oh, by the way, there's another verse that people think is in the Bible. 
Cleanliness is next to godliness. I just, can I just tell you, if you don't know already, don't look for it in the Scriptures, because it's not there. This is, what's my point? My point is, is that we, we have these things that we have to unlearn before we can learn. They, they, they prove themselves to be hindrances that stand in between us and Jesus. And John is helping us clear that up, because this is who Jesus is, and this is why Jesus is who He is, because this is what Jesus wants to do for me, empower me. Can I just get one more thing off my chest before we move on? It's the word enabling. You understand it in the context that it's used in the day in which we live. You're an enabler. Thinking, hmm. Because it's always in the negative context. I'm enabling somebody to do something that they're not supposed to be doing or trying to quit doing, but you keep enabling them. You're an enabler. I'm an enabler. I think, wait a minute. God's an enabler. No, because God's callings are God's enablings. Because see, God's commands are such, John says, they're not burdensome. God will never command us to do anything that He will not also enable us to do. Otherwise, He'd be party to our disobedience. You understand that, right? So, and how many times when we pray, do we pray, God, help me? You know what you're asking Him to do? God, I need you to be an enabler. Enable me. Help me. And God's like, well, good news. I'm an enabler. I'm going to enable you because I can, because I have the power. I am all powerful to enable you and empower you to do that which I have commanded you and called you to do. Now I'm going to, when we get to the second one of verse 16, I'm going to mess you up in Jesus' name, (laughs) because we're going to delineate between power and strength. Stay with me. Jesus not only empowers me, Jesus strengthens me. And here's how I get there. This sharp, double-edged sword that John is describing, different than the one in Hebrews, which we'll get to in a second, or a minute, or five. (laughs) It's, It's a different word in the original language of the Greek New Testament. It's the Greek word romphea. How helpful was that? What does that mean? Oh, this was not a a precision, small sword used in hand-to-hand battle. No, this was a heavy, this was a big, strong, heavy, double-edged sword. When you pull this thing out of the sheath, lights out, game over. You don't want to mess with this. That's the double-edged sword. Okay, Mr. Fancy Pants Pastor, aren't power and strength synonymous? No. I hope this isn't an oversimplification, but there is a difference between, and it's important that we delineate between power and strength, such that strength measures force, power produces force. Let me say that again. Strength is the gauge by which you measure the force, but power is the source that creates the force. Did I make it worse? So understand, when Jesus is all powerful, so too is Jesus my strength. He strengthens me. He's the source of both strength and power. And get this, the symbolism key, it's out of His mouth. Well, what comes out of the mouth of Jesus? His words, the Word of God. 
is the sharp double-edged sword. So that's where the strength comes. It's been said that one week without reading the Bible makes one weak. Oh, please don't make me have to spell it. <laughs> weak, W-E-E-K, weak, like seven days in a week. <laughs> it's been a long week, but I'm not weak. That's the source of the strength. This is Hebrews 4.12. You know this verse well. I love this. Can we, as I read this, can you just view this through a, a, a new lens, fresh fire on the altar? You know how it is when you read a verse over and over and over again, you almost become desensitized to the power of it. So let's just kind of revisit this powerful verse about the strength and the power of God's Word. For the Word of God is living and powerful. And here it is, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Man, that is one strong sword. That is one powerful two-edged sword. And you're telling me that's what the Word of God is? Yeah. And oh, by the way, the Word of God is personified in the person of Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jehovah Witnesses had to rewrite that, by the way. Uh, can I just share with you a true story years ago? I haven't shared it for a while. So we have new people. Just be considerate of them. Um, doing a Bible study. I had business Bible studies before I entered the pastorate. And, uh, you know, just all walks of life, you know, uh, people would attend. I would do them in, you know, the country clubs and the auto dealerships, believe it or not, auto dealers got saved and car salesmen. I know it's shocking, but, and then, you know, I would have them just anywhere that they would let me, I would teach a Bible study there. If they would give me the room, I say, hey, can I have a Bible study? He said, sure. I said, cool. So I taught Bible studies in the uh, business community, because I was, you know, I own my own business, and, and I wanted to reach the businessman. So I started just teaching the Bible expositionally. This is many years ago, when I had hair. But uh, anyway, so I, it was the strangest thing. I know it wasn't strange, because it was God planned it perfectly. I was actually planning on referencing John 1 on this particular Tuesday morning Bible study that I was doing. And one of the guys that attends the Bible study brought a friend. And I, I noticed him, and he was sitting in the back. You could tell by the body language. I won't look at you when I do this. If you're doing this, we love you. God bless you. But this was his body language. You know, so I know right out of the chute, you know, first of all, I'm going to try not to look, but that's hard, right? Don't look at them. <laughs> don't, don't look at them. It's a, it's a psych, psychological thing, you know, when you say, don't look through this hole in this storefront. Just lined up around the block. People, why not? They're looking in the hole. And so you, I'm trying not to look at them. I can already tell. I, I've met this guy before. I mean, his type. Just like, all right, you got me here. Let's see what this guy's got. And I mean, as God is my witness, right out of the chute, I came with, you'll forgive the metaphor, all guns a-blazing. John 1 in the beginning. I had no idea this guy was a Jehovah Witness. And I mean, and there was a, a sanctified boldness. And I mean, I enunciated every word. And I spoke with the power of the Holy Spirit in the beginning. And this guy bolts out of his chair so fast and leaves. His friend who brought him that attends the Bible study stayed. He wouldn't look at me. He's like, I'm sorry. He came up to me afterwards. He goes, J.D., I wasn't Pastor J.D. at the time. I was just 
car dealer, JD. But he just said, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I've been trying to bring this guy to the Lord and invite him, uh, you know, to the Bible study. And he finally agreed. And on the day that I bring him, you, you're in John 1, and he's a Jehovah Witness. And like, that was the Lord. That was the Lord. Um, true story while I'm, while I'm at it. <laughs> I'm on a roll. You remember Dr. Walter Martin, his famous work, Unparalleled Kingdom of the Cults? Okay. He goes into the Jehovah Witnesses headquarters. I'll try to just give you the gist of it. But he, he shares this account of, he goes to the front desk, and this is before his book was published, because once his book got published, then he's already on the radar. So he wanted to just go to the Jehovah Witnesses headquarters before the kingdom of the cults came out, because he was going to, I mean, the, the chapter on kingdom of the cults. First of all, it's a voluminous work anyway. You know, kingdom of the cults, it's got Jehovah Witnesses, Mormonism, then all the others. So he goes in, and there's this guy at the front desk, and he says, if I could prove to you from the Word of God that Jesus is God, you know, they'll, they'll deny that. They'll go as far as you want, like Mormons. He's Savior, He's Lord, He's Redeemer, He's the Son of God, but He's not God. So, and Jehovah's Witnesses are, are a little bit more militant than the Mormons on this. So he goes in, he goes, if I could prove to you from the Bible that Jesus is God, would you renounce Jehovah Witness as a cult? <laughs> now that's going to be an attention getter, a conversation starter right there. He's like, uh, Jesus is not God. He said, no, it's not, you, didn't, you didn't answer my question. If I could prove to you from the Bible that Jesus is God, would you believe? He said, well, no, we're Jehovah Witnesses. He said, no, 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 you're not. So they go around a few times. And finally, Walter Martin, I, I've seen video of him. I would have loved to have known this guy. He starts pounding on this, you know, information counter with this guy going, he's quoting scripture, Jesus is God, Jesus is God. And then threw him out. He said, well, I tried. Many, many years later, this guy shows up at one of Dr. Walter Martin's sessions. And he comes up to Dr. Walter Martin afterwards and says, do you remember <laughs> coming into the Jehovah Witness headquarters and pounding on my counter that Jesus is God, Jesus is God, quoting all the scriptures? I hated you but I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I went into the Bible and I found that Jesus is God. And now I've left Jehovah Witness, the cult, and I am now a born again believer in Jesus Christ. Never, this is parenthetical, I realize, never, ever, ever give up. God's Word will not return unto Him void. It will serve the purpose for which it was intended because it's a sharp double-edged sword. You know it's cutting precision surgically. And here's the thing, when you stay with the Word of God, and use the Word of God, it's the only offensive weapon, by the way, in the spiritual armor that everybody's fascinated with these days in Ephesians 6. But it, it, it cuts, and the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Word, knows exactly what's in that heart, discerns the thoughts. And you know that Jesus could read read people's minds. How's that one? <laughs> Some of the accounts in the Gospels, they thought to themselves, and then Jesus was like, because <laughs> he can, he discerned their thoughts. He could read their minds. And then he would ask them, I would have loved to have seen the look on their face. How'd you know? I'm God, incarnate. Jesus is God. <laughs> so of course I know. And the Word of God. See, let the Word of God do the work. God doesn't need your help. Trust me, I've tried. God, I, I got this one. I'll help you out. Like Peter, you know, cuts off Malchus's ear with his sword. And Jesus is like, dude, heals the... I believe we're going to see this Malchus in heaven. Can you imagine that? Peter cuts off his ear. Ah, 
Jesus heals it. Whoa! I'm getting saved if I'm Malchus, right? So anyway, and then Jesus is like, Peter, come on, man. This is a spiritual battle. You're trying to fight a spiritual battle with carnal and fleshly weaponry. And Paul says our weaponry is not carnal. It's spiritual. This is a spiritual. So don't try to help God. Out. Hey, God, you know, when my boys were young, I didn't let my daughter do this. She just got her driver's license, by the way. And I was hoping the rapture would happen first. But when, when, I, when the, my boys were young, I, I would put them on my lap and let them drive the steering wheel. Whoa, Baba, I'm driving. I'm like, Jesus, come quickly, please, before they actually are driving. That didn't happen either. But um, uh, they, they want to help out. They, you know, I have a project. They want to help out. They, hey, can I, hey, Baba, can I, and they're so adorable. You, know, you can't say no. But what they do is they end up making a bigger problem. And it takes so much longer to do that which you could have done had you not had them help you do what you were trying to get done. And I think we're like that with God. God, let me take the steering wheel and drive. God's going, oh, you're so adorable, but okay, whatever. God, let me help. You know, we bring our little to toy toolbox. Here, God's got this huge double-edged sword going, okay, just when you're done, let me know with your little toy, you know, sword. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I just be God now? Okay. Can you get out of my way? Okay. And then he does it. You're like, wow, <laughs> that was so cool, God. And God's like, I know, because I'm God. But how'd you do that? Well, because see, I can discern what's in the heart. See, man only sees the outward appearance, but God knows the heart. See, like right now, I'm looking at all of your outward appearance. <laughs> you look marvelous, all of you. But God sees your heart. And God knows your heart. And God discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you know that, that physiologically there is actually a mini brain within the heart and the stomach too? That, that saying, you know, go with your gut, there's something to that. How about Paul and Philippians? I'm going way off, but I'll bring it back. Don't worry. Where Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, worry about no thing by thanking God for anything and praying about everything. Okay, well, very interesting. Uh, the peace of God from the God of peace will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here's what's very interesting. He says, that peace will transcend human understanding. In other words, it goes over the head right to the heart. How about this one, the Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, I think in my heart, yeah, so is he. Well, shouldn't it say, as a man thinketh in his head? No, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Did I mess you up? I've got a couple more if you're not messed up yet. So back to our double-edged sword. This is strong. So strong is this sword that it can cut surgically, discerning between soul and spirit. Soul is the emotion, spirit, the spiritual, and joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know, we say, well, we search the Scriptures, but actually the Scriptures search you. Well, let me, I'm going to get into the Word. Well, the Word's going to get into you. And when it's going to, and then it knows right. And it, when my son, last one, and then we'll actually finish here. My son was, uh, oh, he couldn't have been more than uh, my firstborn son. Uh, he couldn't have been more than about a year and a half old. We, we, uh, he got a hernia. How in the world do you get a hernia at a year and a half of age? He wasn't a power lifter yet. So we had to go and take him into an outpatient surgery. And can you believe that we let the physician, the surgeon, take a sharp instrument and cut it into our son's abdomen? 
What kind of parents are you? Loving parents. We got to surgically resolve this problem before it gets bigger. Just like a surgeon, and he's the great physician. We talked about that first service. He removes and cuts out of our lives that which could cost us our lives. I need to take this out before it takes you out. And that's what God's Word does. That's how strong and powerful and living God's Word is. This is a favorite life verse for many. I know my daughter, when we would have our uh, Bible times together when she was little, Philippians 4.13. Everybody's got this memorized. You got it on your wallpaper, your wall, your refrigerator. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to add to this Zechariah 4, 6, which is not so well known or as often quoted. We did reference this last week, because Zechariah is given this vision of this constant, inexhaustible, eternal supply of oil as the power source. And he says to Zechariah, so he said to me, this is the Watch this, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, strength, willpower, nor by power, your own power or strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Before we move on to the third one, I just want to make one more comment, just a thought. When you go home today, I pray, and I'll speak for myself as well, for when I go home today, I pray that God will give me eyes to see those areas in my life where I'm relying on my own strength. Many years ago I was sitting under the teaching of uh, a pastor at a conference, it was his session, and he made this comment, and I know it was directed at me. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where like nobody else had to be there. That was for me. And then I've had people say, how did you know? I'm like, what was your name again? I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know. Anything. Did somebody call you? It sounds like the Holy Spirit might have, uh, because the Holy Spirit knew exactly what you needed to hear. And that was me that day because this is exactly what I needed to hear. And he, it, he had no clue, because I talked about it afterwards. It's like, hey, we need to talk. You said, were you thinking about me? It's like, no. <laughs> but now I am. <laughs> I mean, he made this comment. This was the Lord, through him, said, some people are too strong for God to use. You should have seen me. I'm crawling underneath the chair. I'm like, that was me. I'm I'm too strong for God. In other words, God looks at JD and says, I can't. I want to, but I can't because he's still trying to live the Christian life in the energy of his own strength, his own flesh. And it's not by strength, not by might, not by power, but by my Holy Spirit. If he would just relinquish to me, yield to me. I can do this for Him instead of Him in my strength, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me by His Spirit. Last illustration, we'll move on. You know the water, the power of the water. You're trying to get that canoe into the water from the beach, and you're struggling, and you're using all of your might, and all of your power, and all of your strength. And then here comes the wave, and it effortlessly, you can use your pinky, push it in. Why? Because the power of the water as a type of the Holy Spirit. So what is that situation in our lives that we're going to go home to? Maybe we can take this with us, and, and, and revisit it. Because here I've been striving, and fighting, and arguing, and 
trying in my own strength to resolve it. And the Lord's like this whole time going, hello? Let me know when you're done. I, I got this. But no, we're, I'll use words I know foreign to you, because you're more spiritual than me, like stubborn, obstinate, stiff-necked, too strong, strong-willed. You know those strong-willed, <laughs> when somebody said, oh, you got one of those. What? They looked at our son. He said, you have a strong-willed child. We're like, thank you. God bless you. I hope a bird drops on your windshield on the way home from church in Jesus' name. Come on, don't, you guys, you, you know what I, you do that too. So I want to turn a corner on this third one, because this is so encouraging. Jesus comforts me. I can't get over this verse, verse 17, because John, I mean, can you imagine the blazing fire out of the eyes, the thundering waterfalls coming out of his mouth, and his feet bronze glowing, like glowing embers. You don't even get near them. Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about that. Actually, don't. Ask the guys that died throwing them in that furnace. But just, I mean, what, and wouldn't you do the same thing, if not more? And this is the reaction of everyone who had an encounter with Jesus, when Peter, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. Isaiah, we just talked about, take the coal, cleanse my lips. I, I beheld the glory of His robe, the train of which filled the temple with this glory. And I, I just had to get away. I couldn't look. I'm a sinful man. And throughout Scripture, when people had an encounter with the real Jesus, by the way, this was their response. They're just laid out. I mean, you talk about fear and trembling. It's a holy fear for sure. But John tells us that he, his reaction was, he fell to the floor as though dead, motionless, he, he, speechless. He couldn't move. He couldn't speak. This was the reaction to the glory that was revealed to him in the person of Jesus Christ. But here's what I want to draw our attention to, what Jesus' response is to John's response. I, I know, that, you know, there are clinical terms for people who think like this, but I would have fully expected that Jesus to maybe say something like, John, get up, man, come on. This is another saying I, I take issue with. I'll just get it off my chest. Buck up, buttercup. Oh, have you? I've had my sh fair share of people say that to me, because I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a crybaby. <laughs> I mean, just kind of, book up, buttercup. No, this is really emotional. I'm an emotional guy, and I cry over a menu. I cry when I don't get a menu, too. But, but here's John all laid out, prostrated before the glory of the Lord in all of His majesty. And what's Jesus' response? He takes His hand, and He puts it on John's shoulder. And He says to him, do not be afraid. It's me. Now, it's probably been, I would venture to say, eh, maybe, I've got to be careful when I start to try to crunch numbers here, but I, I want to say about 60 years, maybe, since the resurrection. Let's call it 50 years, just for purpose of discussion. And so the Jesus that, that remember now, John was the one that Jesus said, take care of my mom. 
And John is the one, of course, in his gospel account that is always careful to point out that he, John, was the disciple that Jesus loved. Right? This is the same John. So fast forward to the year 95 AD, approximately, and now he sees his Savior again, way different. And instead of putting his head in his chest when Jesus was here as the suffering Savior, as we're told in the Gospels, he's throwing him. I don't think he threw himself down. I think he just collapsed. I fell as though dead. Here's what I want to say to anyone here today or watching online that is, you need this word. You need to know that the hand of God is on you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You know, you will never find one place in the Scripture where Jesus ever spoke with disdain or disgust, not even to the disciples, even when He said, Oh, gee, you little faith. No, it was compassionate. It was, I I imagine the, the tone of the Savior, just, you guys, Why is your faith so small when your God is so big? And I would imagine that He, we know Jesus wept. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. Jesus wept. He had emotions. I I take issue, there's one more thing I'll get off my chest for today, maybe. But I take issue with these depictions. Of course, I always have. My son told me the other day, he said, there's, I guess, a new uh, film out about uh, t- the Testament you know, with Moses. And he, and he already knew. <laughs> he said, I, I know you're not going to watch it. I said, no, I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. The, I mean, the first opening scene, I'm going to go, no, no. <laughs> all these movies about Jesus, I'm looking at, but first of all, he's not a blonde haired blue eyed guy. So you lost me there. But you know those older movies of Jesus, you know, and it's kind of like, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And the disciples, robotic, we will follow you. (laughs) Again, I told you they have clinical terms for people that think like this, but that's, that's not who my Jesus is. Jesus had passion emotion and power. But He comforted John, like He comforted the disciples. Think about Peter. How many times could He have corrected Peter? He did, but it was always in love. But how many more times did He just like, I could just picture Him just going, Peter, dude, come here, man. It's okay. Puts His arm around him. You have foot and mouth disease. We'll work on that, you know, just, can you just like bring it down a notch, you know? You keep in mind, Jesus fasted all night and prayed to the Father before He chose and called the disciples to follow Him. And when you get into a study of, a character study of who these disciples were, first of all, they were very young at the time, John being one of them. (laughs) Could you imagine? I mean, they left their livelihoods, their fishing boats and careers, and and to follow Jesus. Well, I always imagine Jesus speaking with such comforting, just the sound of His voice, thunderous waterfalls, but also soothing, comforting balm on a weary soul. John, don't be afraid. Whenever you read those words in in the Bible, it's because whoever they were said to were afraid. I know that's deeply profound. Why would Jesus say this to John, don't be afraid, if John wasn't afraid? No, John was terrified. 
And so what's Jesus going to do? He's going to settle him, calm him, comfort him, remind him of who he is and why it is that he has nothing to be afraid of. And maybe that's for you here today. You have nothing to fear. Jesus puts his hand on you and you know his touch and you know his voice when he says to you, don't be afraid. I've got you. I've got this. It's me. It's me. It's me, Jesus. And I love you. Don't be afraid. This last one, verse 18. I mean, this is just, I guess, seals the deal, for lack of a better way of saying it. Jesus is life for me. Jesus empowers me, enables me, strengthens me, comforts me, but He's life for me. He's alive for me. I mean, we, we again, in a can sort of cliche way say, He is alive. But do you know why He's alive? For you. I know. You. Me too. That's why. Why did He rise again from the dead to defeat death for you and for me? That's why. He died so I could live. Jesus is my life, the way, the truth, the life. He defeated death and He holds, this is really cool, He holds the keys. You know how important people feel when they have the Hey, do you have the keys? Yep, right here. (laughs) Pull them out. Wow, you must be important. Yeah, I got the keys. Jesus has the keys to death and life. And He'll let you in. But the only way He can let you into eternal life is vis-a-vis His death to defeat death so you could have eternal life. I know that's a firm grasp of the obvious, but maybe if I say it like this, it'll change the complexion a little bit. Because this is again where we get, you know, so used to a foundational and fundamental truth in the Word of God. You know, we just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. But not so fast. Think about that. Jesus died for me? Yeah. Why? Because He loves you. No greater love hath any man that he would lay down his life for another. I love my wife. I will die for my wife. That's how much I love my wife. My children, I will die for my children. That's how much I love my children. How much greater is the love that God has for us? in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, I don't think I would have done that. (laughs) You wouldn't either. But He did. Why? Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I pray that another thing you'll take home with you today and myself as well. It's just the life and love that Jesus has for me. It was the whole reason. I mean, think about it. Just think this through for a second. Why else would He have done what He did? I mean, when He's in that garden, perspiring His own blood because of the physiological, unthinkable, unimaginable stress physiologically. If you're perspiring your own blood, that is extreme stress and duress. And that's what Jesus was in as He's about to face the cross. And He prays to the Father, if there be any other way to do this, let this cup of suffering pass from me. And then He says, that one word that should be on the lips of every single one of us, nevertheless, not my will, 
but thy will be done. Translated, God, if this is the only way, then here am I. It is the only way. You have to die, so that they might live. That's the why. He didn't have to, you know. Of His own volition and in His infinite agape love for us, He went to that cross. What put Him on that cross? Love. Not the Jews, <laughs> contrary to popular opinion. No, love put Him on that cross. Love for who? You and me. Okay, I want to end. Thank you for your patience. But for those who were not here for the Prophecy Update first service, I need to apprise you of a Board of Directors decision that was made over one month ago on March 17th to disaffiliate from Calvary Chapel. And this for reasons that were bathed in much weeping, praying and fasting by the board leadership and staff for well nigh four years now. Chief among these reasons was, and still is, the strange change that we talked about in today's update, beginning in the year 2020, specific to COVID-19 and the vaccine, so-called. What has ensued was the heartbreaking realization that we were no longer walking together in agreement. It's for this reason that we've already removed our exterior sign from the front of the building. That was like about three weeks ago. To the question of what will change, absolutely nothing, except our name which out of respect will now simply be Calvary Kaneohe. Please know that we remain committed to and will continue with simply teaching the Bible simply, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. Additionally, we're most compelled to teach Bible prophecy. In this, you can clap, that's fine. It's, I was kind of hoping you would, you know, the first service did. Just saying. But this is key. This is very important, because this is basically what it comes down to. I will never cower. I will never falter. I will never tone it down or soften it up or pull it back. In fact, if anything, <laughs> are you kidding me with what's happening in the world right now? Dial it down. No, I'm going to turn it up. Amen. We are committed to teaching Bible prophecy in this, the last hour, so as to get Jesus to people and people to Jesus, as many as we can, and as quickly as we can, in Jesus' name. Capono, come on up. Why don't you stand up? We'll close. Oh. Father, thank you. Thank you that we don't follow anything or anyone. We follow you, Jesus. We here, myself included, are not here for any other reason other than you, Jesus, and your word. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for this description, this vision, this revelation that you gave John of who you are and what you're like and what you're going to do for us and have done for us and will continue to do for us. You're a blessing God, a comforting God, an empowering God. 
You are God. <laughs> you are God. And you became one of us as a man because of your love for us. Jesus, how could we ever thank you? I guess our only consolation is that we have all of eternity to not just thank you, but to praise you and worship you. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. We can't wait till that trumpet sounds and we see you face to face. Oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.